I'm Bob Stern. Um, that's my introduction. And <laughs> you can see my, uh, my kind of legal credentials up there. Um, I'm one of the founders of the BU uh, Center for the Study of Traumatic Encephalopathy, along with Dr. Cantu and Chris Nowinski and Ann McKee. Um, and what my role is, is I'm the person who oversees the clinical research, meaning the research having to do with humans while they're alive. Um, I also have had the incredible honor of being able to interview the um, family members and loved ones of all of the deceased athletes who Dr. McKee studies the brains. And so I don't know whether it's something to be proud of or not. I'm honored that I've heard the stories of chronic traumatic encephalopathy more than any other human being. And uh, it, it touches me and uh, gives me a whole bunch of insight. And so what I'm going to do today is to tell you the story about chronic traumatic encephalopathy. This has been a big thing of media hype over the years and has helped kind of fuel our, our understanding of concussion and brain trauma in general. But the hype, I think, has been overdone. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. So let me just um, start with one of the, the cool things I get to do is I get to hang out with professional football players. I mean, we get to be here. And you know, I, I think it's really cool. And my kids think it's even cooler. Um, but one of the things that happened recently was there, was, there were these two uh, former pros uh, in my office waiting to participate in a research study. And one of them said to the other, hey, I, I just went to this fantastic restaurant with my wife in the South End. And the other one really didn't want to talk and said, oh, really? What, what was the name of the place? And the first one said, oh, geez, I, I was afraid you were going to ask that. that. That's why I'm here in the study. I don't remember. But wait a second. What do you call that long stemmed flower that people give on special occasions? And the first one said, what do you mean, a rose? And he said, that's it. And he turned over to his wife and he said, Rose, what's the name of the place we went to the other day? <laughs> All right, so why am I starting with that? <laughs> because you have to have a sense of humor. Um, it's also right after lunch. People want to take a little nappy. Uh, <laughs> so I want to keep you a little bit awake. But it also is that sense of humor thing. What I have learned uh, in my, my kind of two areas of, of research and clinical work of Alzheimer's disease on one side and this other neurodegenerative disease, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. It is so critical for everyone involved to have a sense of humor. And it's OK to laugh because we have to keep going. We have to find answers. We have to deal with people and interact with people and support people. And laughter is such great medicine for it. Yeah, so you've, you've heard stories of this. You've seen pictures of it already today. It happens down here. Um, these are the big blows, all right? These are the big blows that result in what we're talking about today. We've been talking about concussion. I happen to be talking right now in front of one of the nation's leading concussion gurus, Dr. McGrath. So I'm not going to talk about concussion because I'm afraid to say anything because I'll get it wrong. But those big hits are what we're talking about with concussions. And thank goodness we have great ability to detect concussions right now. If you can't read it in the back, it said, you better sit out the rest of the game. You might have a concussion. But I'm not really here to talk about concussions. So there are two things you need to know. Number one, I am a big football fan. My favorite place to come next to Fenway Park is right here. And you're going to find that hard to believe by the end of this talk that I am still a big football fan. OK, so that's number one. Number two, and this is the real key, if you fell asleep after this, you'd be fine. Concussions are just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the long-term consequences that I'll be talking about. So if we think about repetitive brain trauma as the overall thing, where we have moderate to severe traumatic brain injuries, you know, where people are in a coma for a while, et cetera. And then you have mild traumatic brain injuries or concussions with loss of consciousness, kind of a still on top of the surface. And then you have 
these symptomatic concussions that we've been talking about all day today. That's still just scratching the surface. Everything else we refer to as these subconcussive blows, which are asymptomatic, that Dr. Cantu was talking about earlier, where you have the same type of hit, perhaps the same g-force, but instead of having symptoms or observable signs, the person seems fine. But the brain, the neurons, are doing the same crazy crisis that they would have in a concussion. Things like this, things like linemen. And so these subconcussive blows, again, are impact to the brain with adequate g-force to have an impact on neuronal functioning but without any immediate symptoms. And some sports are indeed very prone to these things. So those football linemen that we see down here, every play of every game and every practice, what do they do? They hit their heads against each other. And when they do that, those start of every play at the line of scrimmage, those hits are around 20 to 30 G. I'll put that in perspective in a minute. What about a high school kid or a college student who plays both sides of the line? Offensive line, defensive line. Well, one side, if you're just an offensive lineman, you likely have around 1,000 or 1,500 of those hits per season. Double that if you play both sides. Soccer heading. Soccer heading is also something that we need to start thinking about. Because each time the ball is headed by the typical soccer player, let's say a midfielder, heading one of these big balls coming down to him, that's around 15 G. And again, the typical player has around 1,000 of those per season. So what does this g-force very loosely translate into? A car going 35 miles per hour into a brick wall is 20 g, 1,000, 1,500 times per season. Just to remind you from your physics classes, what's, what's g? What's force? It's mass times acceleration, and our athletes are indeed getting bigger, stronger, faster. It's not just a perception. There's studies out there that are showing, indeed, our athletes are bigger and faster. This is my favorite athlete in Boston, who sadly didn't play last year. But this is Vince Wilfork. He's 320 pounds, and he can run 50 yards faster than anyone here. 320 pounds at the line hitting you. There's some good data. Dr. Cantu was, um, was mentioning some of this earlier um, about how often kids get hit. And then does it mean anything? And so one study by Brolio and colleagues put these kind of ex accelerometer gizmos in helmets to measure the amount of force. And in these high school players, there were an average of 652 hits per season in excess of 15 G. Those are high school players. One of those players in a high school team had over 2,000 hits greater than 15 G. There's now growing evidence that these subconcussive blows actually do something immediately. Not necessarily right then from one of the blows, but over a season worth there's now several studies that have looked at high school players, college players, using cognitive assessments, things like functional magnetic resonance imaging to look at the activity, the physiology of the brain. Looking at what's called diffusion tensor imaging. I'll show you pictures of this later, but it's a fancy way to use an MRI scan to be able to see the white matter of the brain, the connections of the brain. And in all of these cases, what it's shown is the people who did not have concussions, symptomatic concussions, but played a season and had all these hits, there's now evidence of cognitive impairment, structural impairment, physiological impairment. And as you've heard over and over again, helmets cannot fully protect against the concussions, let alone the subconcussive trauma. Can you see that? OK. Why aren't you laughing hysterically? <laughs> I 
This is an interesting sport. The goal of this sport is what? To create brain damage. That is the goal. I'm not being facetious. That is the goal. Anyone know who this is? Give her free registration for this meeting. Yes, it's Cassius Clay. It was a trick question. It's before he changed his name. So, you know, we all know the, the blank face, the inability to get words out. Uh, no, that's Bush. Um, <laughs> I once told that joke in Texas. <laughs> that was not a good thing to do. There was this woman in the front row who's just shaking her head saying, I can't believe you just did that. I can't believe you just did that. <laughs> so why am I showing you the boxers? Because we have known about the long-term consequences of hitting your head over and over again in sports for a long time, mostly through research and observations of boxers, where the term dementia pugilistica might ring a bell, so to speak, <laughs> for all of you. Dementia pugilistica means the dementia of boxers. It was first described in boxers as long ago as 1928 in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association. The first article about this, a case series of a bunch of boxers, and the title of it was Punch Drunk. And in it, Dr. Martland referred to the long-term consequences of these repetitive hits as resulting in goofy behavior, slug nutty behavior. I love those terms in JAMA. It's great and described if someone lived long enough, they would have dementia and would be required to live in an institution, in, uh, an asylum. Many different things have happened through the years. We now know that boxers aren't the only people who get this disease. The term chronic traumatic encephalopathy has been around for a while too, first in the 1940s, but it never gained attention. It wasn't used in both science and in lay discussions until the year 2002. And why? Because in our country, nothing speaks as loudly as a former NFL player dying and then being found to have this disease. And that's what happened. The first four players, former players, Mike Webster, Terry Long, Andre Waters, Justin Strelzik, died from horrible reasons, most of them. And when their brains were examined, they were found to have this disease that was only found in boxers for the most part. Only referred to most of the time as dementia pugilistica, but more scientifically meaningful was chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And so these two things are the same. Dementia pugilistica, punch drunk, all those things are the same as CTE. So what is it? It's a neurodegenerative disease. Very similar to Alzheimer's disease. It's kind of a cousin to Alzheimer's disease, but it is a unique disease, both neuropathologically and clinically. And it's believed to be caused, at least in part, by repetitive brain trauma, including concussions with the symptoms and all that subconcussive trauma. And that repetitive trauma seems to initiate this cascade of events in the brain that eventually leads to a progressive destruction of the brain tissue, of neurodegeneration. And so it is not prolonged post-concussion syndrome. So it's not like someone had major concussions and they just didn't get better. It is not the cumulative effect of multiple concussions, multiple brain injuries. The disease starts early, probably whenever the person started getting hit a lot. But it, it doesn't show its symptoms and signs. It doesn't become clinically manifest until years or decades after the person stops hitting their head because it's a progressive neurodegenerative disease and it's not until there's enough destruction of the brain tissue in certain parts of the brain for the symptoms to start being seen. And what are those symptoms? Well, we think about them in four different categories. I'll just start with the motor problems. These are, are motor signs of Parkinsonism, the tremor, the wide base gait, the rigid kind of movement, perhaps difficulty speaking, dysarthria, problems walking. But that's almost always seen in boxers. 
And we very infrequently see it in others with repetitive brain trauma. We also know of cognitive difficulties, including memory problems, short-term memory problems, what we refer to as executive functioning problems, things like planning, organization, multitasking, judgment, and then eventually dementia. There's also, mood, ooh, sorry, there's also mood difficulties, including depression, hopelessness, suicidality. And then perhaps the most difficult of the problems associated with this disease are the behavioral, including problems with impulse control, being explosive, aggressive, rageful, often described as having an out of control type of short fuse. And as these things progress, especially the cognitive things, the memory impairment, we see a bunch of different types of presentations. One of the things I did was with our confirmed cases of, of CTE, people who died and we saw actual CTE. What I did was I looked at the presentations that those family members described after doing those interviews. And I found that there were two different subtypes. One group seemed to start having mood and behavior difficulties earlier in the course of their disease. Let's say in one's 30s and 40s. Hopelessness, suicidality, impulse control, short fuse. And the cognitive difficulties didn't come until later. And then there was another group who didn't have those problems with mood and behavior early on. They started having cognitive difficulties later in life, in one's 50s, 60s, 70s. Some of them did not get the behavior and mood problems. Some of them just looked a lot like the typical cognitive and memory impairment we see in Alzheimer's disease. And eventually, it led to dementia. As an Alzheimer's person, I speak about dementia a lot. And what I realize is that very few people, even specialists in our field, don't know the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia, let alone CTE and dementia. So let me just spend a couple minutes clarifying that. What is dementia? It refers to the new loss of memory and at least one other cognitive function that's bad enough to get in the way of daily life. That's all it is. Memory and other cognitive difficulties that get bad enough to get in the way of independent living. It is not a disease. It is not an illness. Dementia is just this clinical syndrome. It's like having a fever. If you have a fever, what does it tell you? You're sick. Yeah. It doesn't tell you what's causing it. Same thing with dementia. It's the end result of something. Some of those things are reversible like hypothyroidism, vitamin deficiencies, even clinical depression. But then there's these other things, these neurodegenerative diseases, these progressive diseases of the brain that rob the person of their memory, of other cognitive functions, and then eventually gets in the way of daily life. Alzheimer's disease is the most common disease of the brain that leads to dementia. Around three quarters of the cases of dementia are caused by the disease, Alzheimer's disease, as the disease progresses. But CTE is another one of those diseases that if it progresses enough, it will eventually lead to dementia. Does that make sense? Yes? The differentiation between, ah, ah, that is, the, that, is, that is what keeps me awake at night, and I'm going to talk about that. For those of you who didn't hear it, the, the question is, how do you differentiate it? How do you know what the disease is? You're right. We can describe dementia. We can describe all those symptoms I just told you about. But how do we know what the disease is? All right, so this is kind of the answer, at least for now. Like Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases, CTE right now can only be diagnosed after death. That's a problem. My colleague Ann McKee has examined more brains with CTE than any other person in the world. In our brain bank, we have over 150 brains, maybe close to 200 at this point, with over 100 that have been diagnosed with CTE already. We had a paper that came out last year in a major journal that described the largest collection of cases of CTE. And what it is, at least neuropathologically, is an abnormality in the brain that's described, characterized by an abundance of a protein that goes awry. It's called the tau protein. 
It's a protein that we all have to have in our brain cells. But in this case, it goes wrong. It goes bad. And it starts clumping together into these things called neurofibrillary tangles, as well as astrocytic tangles when it's in the, the helper cells, the glial cells. And eventually, it leads to a widespread distribution of this abnormal tau around the brain. But early on, it has a very unique presentation. I'll show you pictures of it in a minute. With this tau stuff, accumulates around the blood, little blood vessels and at the depths of the cortical sulci. Those are the valleys in the brain, you know, in the cortex. You know how your brain has the ups and downs stuff? Well, at the depths of those valleys, that's where this abnormal tau seems to start, and also around those blood vessels. And for those of you who know anything about Alzheimer's disease, Alzheimer's has tau problems as well. But the tau is in a very different type of location in the brain and presents very differently. But Alzheimer's disease also must have another protein that goes bad called beta amyloid. And those, that beta amyloid creates these plaques around the nerve cells. And in CTE, we don't have that. So it's a very easy distinction, actually, between Alzheimer's and CTE after someone dies. Let me give you some cases, just to make this kind of a little more human. The first case of a former football player who we were able to examine after death was that of John Grimsley. Grimsley was uh, a Houston Oiler linebacker. He was a pro bowler, superb player. He died, sadly, at the age of 45. When he was talking to his wife, Virginia, while he was alive, he was remembering that he had around eight diagnosed concussions. Isaiah, who's in the back, you, you had eight or nine diagnosed concussions. Those are the big ones, right? If they're diagnosed in the NFL back in the 90s, those were big. But he was a linebacker. All those subconcussive hits, all those unreported concussions. Following his NFL career, he was a very successful hunting and fishing guide. And I tell you that because he knew his way around firearms. But for the five years prior to his death, he started having a really bad worsening memory. He started being out of control, having a short fuse. And then one night, he was cleaning his guns. He was alone in the house. There was no alcohol, no drugs in his system. And he forgot to take out the ammunition and shot himself accidentally in the abdomen or the chest. It was investigated, found not to be suicide. Just one of these problems with either planning, organization, multi-stepping, or memory. Well, here's his brain. On the top is just a photo scan of a thin slice of brain tissue that's been stained with a special stain that turns brown when it attaches to that abnormal tau. Underneath is a microscopic enhancement of a small section of that. So on the top, what you're seeing, this is the temporal lobe. And this brown stuff is the destruction of brain tissue by this abnormal protein. And underneath it, these big things are those neurofibrillary tangles inside the nerve cells. And all the other brown stuff are these neuropil threads. Like the, the tau just breaks out of the cells and just distributes around the cells. So how do I know this is bad? Well, here's a brain of a 65-year-old healthy individual. No cognitive difficulties, no nothing. A 65-year-old, 20 years older. There ain't no abnormal tau. There shouldn't be. Greater perspective, this is the brain of a 73-year-old professional world-class boxer, well-known around these parts. He was in a long-term care facility for many years with the clinical diagnosis of dementia pugilistica. And sure enough, he had it. But look at this. A 45-year-old football player compared to the 73-year-old boxer. This is so much more advanced, but look, it's the same disease. Our second case of a former football player was that of Tom McHale. McHale, by coincidence, died also at age 45. He was a nine-year veteran lineman. In college, he played at Cornell, where he uh, met his, uh, his wife, Lisa. Smart guy. Lisa 
and, and Tom had this incredible relationship. He would talk about everything. Lisa never heard of a single concussion. Not through college, not through the pros. Family never told anyone any, about anything. He never complained about anything. His teammates, his athletic trainers, his team doctors, never a reported concussion. But he was a lineman. Every play of every game and every practice for years and years and years. Wonderful guy. And after his NFL career, he became a very successful restaurateur in the Tampa Bay area, owned several restaurants, was doing great. Wonderful father of three, loving husband. And then he started becoming addicted to narcotics that he had to take for orthopedic problems. And he was described as out of control with his addiction. Would go into rehab, come out. Go into rehab, come out. Could not control his behavior. Sadly, he died of a drug overdose accidentally at age 45, leaving that wonderful family. And when Chris Nowinski called Lisa to say, hey, um, would it be possible for us to study your husband's brain? She just thought about it for a second and said, yeah, you know why? Because he would be a great control for you, meaning he never had concussions. And in those days, this was six years ago, our thinking was you had to have concussions to get CTE. We didn't know about the subconcussive stuff just six years ago. So we said, she said yes. And we looked at it, and sadly, all those subconcussive hits throughout all those years, same amount of disease as John Grimsley. Some of you may have heard of Dave Duerson. He played on that Chicago Bears team that Pete Brock, Brock played against years ago. I think that was like in 1912, something like that. <laughs> well, Duerson was an incredible player. And after he re retired, he was a very successful businessman. He made millions of dollars in the food distribution business. And then five years prior to his death, he died at age 50. So starting around 45, Everything spiraled out of control. He started having short-term memory difficulties. He was, be, his behavior was just out of control, had a short fuse. He was hot-tempered. He became aggressive. Unfortunately, he also became physically abusive and started abusing his wife of so many years. Something completely out of the blue. He lost his business due to bad business decisions, poor judgment, and he lost his marriage, his family, due to his out-of-control behavior. He committed suicide by shooting himself in the chest in order to save his brain. And he left a suicide note saying, please give my brain to us. He knew what he had. It's not just football. Because if it were just football, I'm not sure we'd be as concerned about it. Not that we're not concerned about football players, but we'd say, this is a kind of a unique thing. Dr. McKee's Found CT in over 80, player, 80 individuals, mostly football players, because that's whose brains get donated to us. But of, again, obviously, it's been found in boxers. But we've also found it in pro hockey players. But it's been the enforcers, the fighters on ice, not the routine players. We've even found it recently in a professional baseball player, Ryan Friel, who played like no one else. He would be the one who would be charging into the wall, over the wall, hitting his head. He had to get carried out on a stretcher from the field three times because of head injuries. He had a bunch of hits to his head when he was a kid, and he had the disease. He died of suicide at age 36. We just found it in the first rugby player from Australia. Tizza Taylor was a very well-known rugby player. He died at age 77, um, played for years and years. But in, ages, in his 50s, he started having cognitive difficulties and was fully demented in his 60s and was in a nursing home for years. And he died finally at age 77. And if you look at this brain, there's no brain left. It is all tau destruction. There's no beta amyloid. This is not Alzheimer's disease. It's not any other disease. It is CTE that has completely destroyed his brain. But it's not just pros. 
We found CTE in people who just played through college. We found it, sadly, in people who just played high school football. This was a case of a, a guy who um, was this amazing lineman, played hard from the age of nine on. His brother down here played with him through most of his years. His brother, his parents, two wonderful people. No one ever knew of a single concussion in this guy, Owen Thomas. His pediatricians, his team doctors, his athletic trainers, all through life, including at UPenn, where he had just been voted the co-captain of the UPenn team at the end of his junior year. Sadly, without any warning, without any note, impulsively, he hanged himself in his off-campus apartment and died at age 21. And his brain, at age 21, started showing those telltale signs of the disease in the depths of the sulci, around blood vessels, greater magnification. This is never seen in a 21-year-old, no matter what. Eric Pelly died at age 18 years from second impact syndrome. Okay? So it wasn't CTE that killed him. But we were able to look at his brain and see what happens with second impact syndrome. His brain at age 18 also had those telltale signs of the disease. All right, so at this point, the neuropathology of this disease is pretty well described. And it's had this huge impact on the world. These pictures have painted a thousand words. Great awareness about public, for public policy, for changes of rules, for all 50 states now having concussion laws. But the public thinks we know more than we actually do. The science of CTE is just beginning. And so, you know, you've seen all this stuff in our, our group at BU, did the focus of a lot of these things, unbelievable growth in awareness and media attention, and hype, just unbelievable hype. Over a five-year period, this has happened. Science, however, goes like this. Even in the best of times, science is going to move like that. But these have not been the best of times for science. NIH funding has been at an all-time low. Give you an idea of how crazy the, the media hype has been. This was an episode of Harry's Law, the TV show, Harry's Law, the lawyer show. This was a couple years ago, and they had a case of CTE. They actually called the, the episode Head Games, stealing it from Chris Nowinski. And in this episode of Harry's Law, they needed a BU researcher to come to the stand to talk about CTE. Look familiar? <laughs> My wife says I'm more handsome. <laughs> One week later to the day, Law & Order SVU had a case of CTE where they had a former NFL player who was demented and doing impulsive, inappropriate things. And they needed a BU researcher. This is Ann McKee. In cases of CTE, there is often damage to the frontal This was the BU researcher they bring in. Other great science, well, the good wife, they had a case of CTE. They at least called me on the phone to get script advice. And I said, sure, as long as I get to meet Juliana Margolis. <laughs> Didn't happen. I gave it to them anyways. House, who's my most revered diagnostician, he ruled out CTE. These people couldn't even pronounce CTE. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy. <laughs> CSI had a piece on CTE. This is bonkers because this is really where we are. Aww. <laughs> We're at the infancy of our understanding of this disease, and yet everyone thinks we know a whole lot more. And so very important questions remain, such as, is it even common? Should we even be talking about it? Well, we don't know. We really have no idea. In our hands, yes, 52 out of 54 pro football players whose brains have been examined have had CTE. Wow, that sounds like a huge number, right? Great percentage, but that's bias. That's the brains that are donated to us. We have no idea what the actual proportion would be if we looked at all brains. 
And so we need longitudinal research. We need a larger sample size. Our group just got a large NIH grant um, to do that, to look at the neuropathology of a lot of brains over years and years. Other questions. Why do some people get it and some people not? So far, every single case in the history of this disease, every single case of neuropathologically confirmed CTE has had a history of repetitive brain trauma. Whether that means, sadly, a woman who was domestically abused and was found to have CTE, a developmentally disabled individual who was a headbanger was found to have CTE. There was even a case of a dwarf clown who was sent out of a cannon over and over again who had CTE, let alone all of these cases of athletes as well as now military. We found servicemen who were in the Afghanistan and Iraq, and Iraq conflicts who had been exposed to the IEDs and blast trauma and had repeated blast trauma, who then died from a variety of things, and they had CTE. So every case of this disease neuropathologically has had a history of repetitive brain trauma. So what does that tell us? It tells us that repetitive hits to the head are a necessary variable to get this disease. But it's not sufficient. Because not everyone who hits their head is going to get it. Real important. Kathy, you said it earlier today in your talk. Parents need to know. Everyone needs to know. Just because you had a concussion, you shouldn't worry that you're going to get CTE or that you're going to commit suicide. Those are the irrational fears that have come out of this. But we need to figure out what are those risk factors. Above and beyond just having that history, are there genetics that put people at increased risk? So my group is looking at a variety of genes to see what might increase the risk. What also about the exposure to the hits might put one person at greater risk and another person not? Maybe it's the severity or the type of the hits. Maybe it's the overall duration that someone keeps getting hit over a number of years. Maybe it's the amount of rest in between the hits. One of the things we looked at was the age of the first hits. Because we know from neurodevelopmental research that there's this window of vulnerability at around puberty where the brain is doing these incredible growth things in, in males between the ages of 10 and 12. And so one of the things we looked at was looking at a big group of people who played football at all different levels. People who just played high school, people who went to college level, people who just, goodbye, I wasn't that bad. People who, <laughs> peep bye, <laughs> people who played pro. All different types of backgrounds and stuff. And we see them as adults and do a, all this testing of their cognition and mood and behavior. And we ask them, when did you start playing football? See it again. You know how old those kids are? Seven, eight. So what did we find in our study? That former football players across all those levels who started playing tackle football before age 12 had significantly greater executive functioning problems, mood problems, and behavior problems than people who started playing football at age 12 and older. We've seen it now in two different groups of football players, some with self-report, some with more objective neuropsychological testing. But I don't know if that means they're getting CTE. But what it's telling us at least is that in these early studies, we might now start having some data to support what Dr. Cantu has been saying very you know, aggressively of we shouldn't have contact sports before age 14. Well, now we have a little bit of data to suggest, well, maybe there's something to that. And age 12 might be a certain point where we need to think about it. So how do we answer a lot of those questions? How do we answer the questions of how common it is? 
Why do some people get it? How do, what are the risk factors, et cetera? Well, diagnosing it during life would be the big thing. Because we could differentiate between CTE and Alzheimer's disease, between CTE and post-traumatic stress disorder in the military. In early cases, between PTSD and those persistent problems of post-concussion syndrome, we could understand the true incidence and prevalence of it. We could determine those risk factors. And very importantly, we could begin clinical trials of new ways to intervene for the treatment and hopefully to even prevent it. And the way to do that is what we call biomarkers. Think about every illness outside of the brain. Heart disease, cancer, arthritis, diabetes, you name it, every kind of illness and, and disease, there's a test for it. You know if you have it. The brain is the only organ for which there are no tests that tell you definitively if you have a disease until after you die. It's because the brain is so un unbelievably complex. But there's been work now for the last several years for Alzheimer's disease to develop these objective biomarker type of tests to help us diagnose that disease during life. So fortunately, I'm able to piggyback on what we've learned in Alzheimer's to help us develop ways to diagnose CTE during life. So I was lucky to get a grant from the NIH to do one of the most important things in science, and that was to create a really great acronym. <laughs> And the really great acronym, Di Diagnosing and Evaluating Traumatic Encephalopathy Using Clinical Tests, says DETECT. That's pretty cool, right? Nobel Prize? <laughs> right there. So what this study is, is a study of 100 former NFL players who come to Boston. They're all between the ages of 40 and 69 with highest exposure to repetitive brain trauma, playing lineman, linebacker, running back, defensive back. And then 50 same age other athletes who never hit their heads, non-contact sport athletes. And they go through this incredible um, uh, program of neuroimaging with the most advanced type of scans. We do lumbar punctures, spinal taps, to be able to look at spinal fluid proteins. We look at electrophysiological functioning with an EEG. We get blood for DNA so we can look at a whole variety of potential genetic markers. And we do these really big clinical examinations, neuropsychological testing, motor assessments, neurological exams, psychiatric interviews, self-reports for behavior and mood, all these things. Preliminary findings from this so far have been actually quite striking. The former NFL players with this, some symptoms and the highest amount of hits compared to controls have the highest amount of this tau in their spinal fluid. Pretty significantly different finding. We look at diffusion tensor imaging, which allows us to see the white matter tracks in the brain to see if there's been destruction of the white matter. And everywhere where you see the red and orange and yellow, those are significant differences between the former NFL players and the control athletes. We look at something called magnetic resonance spectroscopy that's allowing us to see the biochemical metabolites in the brain. It's like a, a virtual biopsy. By using an MRI scanner, we can actually then measure the chemicals in the brain. And what we found is a significant difference in a variety of chemicals between the former NFL players and these control athletes. But the next step would be to actually image that bad protein tau in the brain while someone's alive. That would be so cool. Really, really cool. And something I never thought I'd be saying in public that we could actually do. Because when I started this study, there was no chance that we'd ever be able to do that, at least for many, many years. And then two years ago, two different groups, three different groups around the world started presenting the earliest data of being able to do just that. I've been able to collaborate with one of the groups that has really led the pack in developing these new PET scan approaches to measure tau in the brains while people are alive. This just gives you an idea. These are in 
uh, four different people with varying levels of Alzheimer's disease because tau is also in that disease, right? A healthy control, someone with what's called mild cognitive impairment, someone with mild dementia from Alzheimer's disease, and someone with severe dementia from Alzheimer's disease. And everywhere that you see the lit up part, that's this specific protein. And so fortunately, my colleague Dr. Shenton and I got a grant from the Department of Defense to bring back some of our former NFL players and controls, as well as some people with Alzheimer's dementia, and give them this new scan, as well as an amyloid scan that's been available, so we can differentiate between them and detect this disease while people are alive. We're also now just starting in two weeks major study with this with the same type of PET scans in the remaining group of 30 people coming in for this detect study. So they're going to get all those other tests plus a tau scan and an amyloid scan. This is as exciting as I ever thought this could be. But I need your help if anyone knows any former Major League Baseball players. Seriously? <laughs> In order to finish this, we have tons of former NFL players lined up. But I need just a handful. We only need 10 total. And I'm going all around the country pleading with people. I just need 10 former NFL players, thank you, Isaiah, who are between the ages of 40 and 69. Baseball, baseball players, I mean. Baseball players who never played contact sports and weren't catchers. What age? 40 and 69. Please send them our way. So what about treatment? This is kind of the, the last frontier. Well, are there any meaningful treatments for CTE right now? No, not yet. There are, however, some ways to treat the symptoms. And so anyone who thinks they have CTE shouldn't give up all hope because there are things that can be done for treatment of symptoms like the depression, like the lack of energy, the poor attention, perhaps the, uh, the unstable mood, the cognitive difficulties. There are some things available to treat those temporarily. And there's also great ways to improve someone's health through, through exercise, through nutrition, through taking omega-3 fatty acids, things like that, to reduce inflammation. That's going to be good for anyone. But in contrast to some claims out there, there ain't nothing available that can actually alter the course of this disease. There are some people who just kind of guess, if you can't see it, the doctor has been asked or uh, told, if you're stumped, why not write an illegible prescription and hope the pharmacist comes up with something? But where we are now is that there will be anti-tau medications. They're on the horizon. They're already being worked into a variety of clinical trials. So they're happening. But I can't use them until I can diagnose this disease during life to know who the right people are to use it with. So if you think of CTE as starting up here when it's preclinical, you know, they're just those little tiny spots that you saw. But then it gets bad, and someone might start having some mild symptoms, and then it gets worse and worse with the dementia, and then ultimately death. Well, typically, you start treating something like this after someone has symptoms, right? And it might, if we could alter the course of the disease, it might give someone a little better functioning or less worse functioning. How about that? But we can't bring it back. Once the, the disease has ruined the brain tissue, you can't bring back brain tissue. So what if, through these biomarkers, we could actually diagnose people earlier and earlier? and we had anti-tau medications or other appropriate treatments, and we started it up here, what happens is we actually do prevention. And so between this and trying to figure out what the risk factors are, those are our goals right now. To be able to diagnose it objectively while people are alive, to be able to figure out who's at risk so we can do something to prevent it, and to be able to start new medications at the earliest possible stage before the brain gets hurt. Other ways to prevent it might be to take a message from these Rams who say, I read that story about dementia and former NFL players. Maybe we should reconsider this. So with that, these are the places that I get funding from for my research. And really, the critical thing are all the wonderful people who 
do all the hard work. I just get to stand up and talk about it. Um, but uh, some incredible colleagues and staff and students, etc. So with that, um, thank you. Couple questions. Yeah. Have you thought of tracking it um, geographically? You know, Texas, Ohio, Florida, where football, you know, walk. Yeah, that's a very big question. Um, we do have a very large registry of individuals now who we're following longitudinally, and we do look at where people came from. Yeah, because of that important issue. Some people just start right out of the womb, hitting their heads. Um, other people start later. So there's a lot of different issues involved with it. Yes? Do you think those spots on the scan where the brain has those tau proteins, is that where the damage occurred? Or do the tau proteins clump and then migrate? That's a great, great question. So the question, for those of you who couldn't hear it, those early spots, the brown spots, are, is that where the damage occurs or does it migrate elsewhere? Well, we're trying to figure out why it starts in those places. And it has something to do with, not, it's not where the impact was, but it's where, per, in the depths of the cell site, it's where the pressure is. And around the blood vessels, well, there's stretching and shearing in these hits. And that stretching and shearing in certain types of hits might kind of stretch the blood vessels and cause them to lose their integrity. And that can allow this buildup of this abnormal cascade of, ch of changes. But why does it start in those little places and go elsewhere? There's something called prions. And a prion is a protein in the brain that starts one place and then travels. And that's what's probably happening here. Several of these neurodegenerative diseases act as prion diseases, where it starts one place and then we're trying to figure out why it then migrates to another area. One more question? Yes? Is all of your research based in Boston? Um, all of my research is based in Boston for now. I have collaborators all around the country that do certain things, but they, uh, for now, mostly I send samples or send blood or things like that. But we're going to be expanding this to especially Arizona um, in the near future and probably Las Vegas where there's a lot of boxers. Um, but for, for now, my research is um, uh, here in Boston, except that for that longitudinal larger study, it's all based on telephone and web reporting. So people are all over the world for that because we don't have to see them in, per in person. All right, well, thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you.